Hi church, I'm Lil and I'll be bringing the reading today from Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. And now therefore, let me, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraving, engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came a calf. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbour. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, 
Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf the one that Aaron made. Reading that passage for us. Uh, if you're uh, right now uh, listening in, or whoever you are, we pray that during this season that we're in in Melbourne with the snap lockdown, that the Lord is ministering to you. If you call Canterbury home, please do continue to get in touch with the pastoral team so that we may continue to serve you. It's been a joy and privilege to hear in the way that the church has been gathering around one another, loving and praying one another during this season. If you're new to Canterbury, we as a church have been going through the book of Exodus. Uh, We've been taking our time and we've been seeing and being, what's been revealed to us is the very true account of how the God of the universe and his relationship in particular with the people of Israel. And because though that these words are true, they're God's words, they actually transcend time, traditions, And so whether if you are sceptical to this, uh, maybe you're someone who's been following our series, or maybe you are someone who's a follower of Christ, these words that you heard this morning are relevant for us even today. The morning that we're looking at this particular passage, I've got to be honest with you, as I've been preparing this sermon, it's a heavy passage. Exodus 32 is a heavy passage. And I would argue it's probably one of the most significant sections in the Bible. What it does is it fully displays who God is and it fully displays who people, what people are like. And actually reveals to us the reality of all our hearts. It reveals the, 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 the ugliness and the significance of sin and also reveals the need for atonement. And that's what I want us to consider this morning. What I want us to consider is the very ugly and reality of sin and the need for atonement. With that in mind, would you join with me in prayer? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Father in heaven, I know that right now, even though we're here doing this live stream and You see every single house, you see every single person, you know exactly where our hearts are at right now. So we ask, through the power of your spirit, through the power of your word, would you reveal more of yourself to us? May we walk away knowing more who you are, who we are, and who your glorious and most merciful and wonderful son is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we began this particular section in Exodus, just a few weeks back, I don't know if you remember, it's up here on the screen, God spoke these words to Moses and the people were there listening in. He said in Exodus 20 these words, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." So when these words were said, it's not like just Moses, but actually the very people would have heard this. The leaders of that time would have also heard this. God made it very clear to them what it means to be his people, that they had to show full allegiance to him. More importantly, it was an exclusive relationship. It meant exclusive worship of God alone. 
So when he speaks to Moses now, as that story continued, he gave instructions to Moses to say, well, I'm going to come and dwell amongst you. I'm going to live with you. And to do that, you need to prepare a house for me. And the instructions were given. And this meant that for you to have access to me as a people, you need a mediator through like the high priest. And that's when we spoke of last week with Aaron and his sons in their service to the Lord. And so when we read Exodus 32, it's like almost like, you know, that pinnacle of any story. You hear it and go, wow, this is awesome. It's going really well. And then Exodus 32 comes and you go, ugh. So for the original here is then, and even for us today, it actually should stir something in us. It should shock us. It should make us go, well, how can this even be? Why? So Moses is meeting with God up in the mountain. God is speaking to him. In many sense, I love the way it's written here, is that God has given Moses, in a sense, the very first recorded Bible written by the very hands of God. And then down the mountain, in verses 1 to 6, we have this reality. What it means to be a people, and including a leader, who, in a sense, forget who God is, and what it means to his people. But what it reveals much more deeper is the depth and the ugliness of sin. The depth and ugliness of sin. And the language here is that the people, uh, they're wondering why Moses is delaying. And maybe they're thinking, oh, maybe he's not going to come back. You know, he's gone to see God. Uh, Maybe there's a sense of disappointment. But you know what? I'm wondering what's going on is actually they're getting quite impatient. And what you're seeing is a couple of responses. You have the people, I want you to imagine, come to Aaron and not they ask him, they demand of him, Aaron, get to work, get up. Make us a God who will go before us. What a statement. I mean, just earlier, haven't we already heard? We don't have to go too far to be reminded Who has already gone before them? Who has freed them from Egypt? God did. Who parted the Red Sea? God did. Who defeated all the idols that they worshipped to say that he is the one and only true God? God did. Who is now making a way for them to have a relationship with him? God is. The very impatience leads his people to break the very commandment that God said they must not do. That is to worship any other God but him. So they're not only questioning God and who he is and his authority and his word, but they're also questioning Moses, I think. And what's displayed here is the very heart that says, God, I haven't got time for this. Let me take things and matters into my own hands. Friends, what we're seeing is a real picture of what sin does. The ugliness and the problem of sin that we all have. That is the very heart posture that says, God, I know what I'm saying. I know I'm the one in charge. I want what I want. I want things in my terms, my way. And this is the picture that's shown in front of us, that they turn away from the God of the universe. This demand that they ask for not only leads them into sin, it causes the one man who should have known better. The one man who has actually heard what God has commanded. The one man who should have stood there and said, no, we're not doing this. It's almost like he just turns around and says, okay, some moment, if you're hearing the story for the very first time, I want you to imagine as this story has been repeated through the history of Israel, it's almost like if you're a little kid, you'd turn around and say, what? What's he doing? He asks the people to do what? To take the rings and gold and bring it to me. It is a visual picture of an offering brought towards this false god. But we want to remember, where did they get these rings of gold? Where did they get all this from? Remember how God had said that God would provide for them? God is the one who provided these things for them as they left Egypt. Now what Aaron is saying is, give these things 
to not the God of the universe, but to this God, so that I will make a, a God with my own hands. And that's what Aaron does in verse 3. He goes and he fashions something together. A better way to read it, it's like forming and shaping it. Do you know where these words of forming and shaping comes uh, exactly the very first time? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it's up here on the screen. Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living creature. What's going on here in this moment is Aaron, who should be rebuking the people, is breaking God's command, but also, in a sense, what he's doing, he's becoming a creator, creating and forming a God for himself and for his own people for their own purposes. Friends, what it's showing is the ugliness of sin that ultimately says, I want to be God. I determine who God is. And after this we see, right, what does he say in verse 4? These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Every single word is like a slap to the face of the God of the universe. But at the same time, the text has this really interesting thing where Aaron says it, it's almost like all of a sudden he says it, and they bring it, and then he creates it. And he has this moment when he realizes, oh, they're worshipping the idol. Uh, 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 let me see, let me see, how can I fix this? And verse 5 says, he builds an altar and proclaims. And what does he say? Um, tomorrow we're going to do a celebration. To who? The Lord, Yahweh. It is the same God that we speak of in the God of the Bible. What he does is he's equating this God that he's created to the God of the universe. What he's doing is it's almost like he's bringing it together. He's trying to make this God like the God of the universe. He's actually just going back to, as historians say, what most likely they would have worshipped in Egypt. But what he's doing also deeper than that, as one commentator put it, Aaron seems here to be trying to do what Moses has intended to do, to make a feast to Yahweh in Sinai. Um, in our world, we may think this is a bit silly, but what's going on here, another way of using, another term that we might use is syncretism. Now, it's a fancy way of saying what we do is we see the things and beliefs and systems of this world, and then we try to fit it into what God has to say in His Word and who He is. A few weeks back, um, while I was here at the office, I got a phone call from someone who works with an organization that well, they call Multi-Faith Dialogue. And this individual went and asked me, would I be interested in being in, 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 with a panel? And the aim of this panel was you had different people from different faiths and he said, since I'm an evangelical Christian that I could represent um, who Jesus is. And I said, oh, that's great. And I said, explain to me what this means. And he said, oh, well, you know, you guys pretty much believe all the same thing. This religion, that religion, it's all about love, isn't it? I don't know if you've heard that before. Where you shape something and change something to create your own God. See, what's going on here to Aaron and the people, they create this God and the very fruit of it is very clear. They wake up and they play. Now, the English translation is probably not the most helpful here. Now, I don't want you to picture for a moment, it's a bunch of families getting to get up in the morning and they have a campfire and they get the board games out and they have a bit of time, a bit of fun and relax together. No, that's not what's going on language is pretty strong in saying it's like they would have had sexual orgies, wild drunkenness, and everything in between. It's a, it's a way of saying they did everything imaginable that's against God and what he requires. And they actually bring offerings and sacrifices, and they live as they please. Friends, this shows the ugliness and depths of sin. What sin that ultimately does, worship that ultimately does, that moves away from the creator of the universe, is always self-indulgent. Now, if you're anything like me, you and I might be tempted to roll our eyes at the people of Israel and Aaron and go, these guys, seriously? Well, actually, it's there also for us today as a warning. 
Actually, the Apostle Paul speaks of this. It's up here on the screen, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 to 7. Now these things took place examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And then in verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. The very words that we see in Exodus 32 are there for us as an example and as instruction, and it's also a warning of the reality of sin. It reveals the depths and ugliness and the problem of sin, that it corrupts us all. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there. You might not be bowing down to some sort of golden calf or cow in front of your lounge room. And if you are, please do get in touch with us. But here's the thing. You and I are all tempted to bow down to create a God to our liking. That suits us. That is made by the hands of our heart. How many of us have heard this before? It's all the same. As long as you stay positive, love one another. Oh, come on. The Bible's a little bit outdated I mean, I can't really, be- seriously, like, does the Bible really say marriage is between a man and a woman? I mean, sex and sexuality, it seems really outdated. Isn't God love? Love wins, right? Oh, yes, yes, it's about grace. But you know what? But to be really Christian, you need to wear these type of clothes, sing these types of songs, and you need to only read from this particular Bible version. Friends, what's really going on underneath this is that the ugliness and depths of sin. Sin does tempt us. Sin calls us to worship something and someone else. But sin creates in us a distrust of who God is and trusting His Word. Sin also takes and distorts something. Ultimately, what it does is it reshapes it and makes it to ultimately say, come, come. Let's worship this thing that will allow us to live as we please. Sin ultimately says, do what is popular as to what is right in God's eyes, according to his word. I mean, Aaron, instead of saying no, he gives into the fear of man. Friends, the account here is to actually to wake us up, to, to shock us. And that is to show us the reality. This is the story of all of us. I mean, I don't know, on a very basic level, I don't know if you've experienced this, I know that I have. When we've gone on mission trips and done amazing things for the Lord and Monday comes and it's like we've forgotten about it. We go to a big conference or or even coming on a Sunday service and we love singing songs to Jesus and worshipping Him and there's great encouragement and then Monday comes and the temptations are there. The idol calls to come and worship it. I mean, even in this season that we're living in nowadays with social media and the various things going on, how many times do we hear of those who proclaim the good news of the gospel, who said they're followers of Christ, turning away and falling to whatever sin it might be? As the very pressures of their own heart and the temptations of the world that says, you know what, I'm going to surrender to this, I'll worship this idol. But friends, if you belong to Christ, you and I should, in a sense, sense that battle against sin every day. Hang on. The great encouragement is there is hope. There is hope against sin. But first, we need to be confronted by the deception and the ugliness, what sin does, that leads us to worship something in someone else other than God. And friends, if you don't know who God is, I want you to know the God of the Bible in Exodus is still the same God today. He is zealous for our worship. Whether you realize it or not, you are worshiping something or someone else. Something or someone else of your own making. And friends, if you're a follower of Christ, do we still believe that God is zealous for our worship of Him alone? 
Are you and I still tempted to reshape God to our liking, what we think he should be, rather than according to what his word says? Do we put our confidence in something or someone else? You and I might not have a golden calf or an idol in front of us, but in this world that we live in, you and I have all types of golden calves that we bow down to. Various things, whether if it's sexual sin that we always talk about, but there's even underneath that. What about financial stability in the world that we live in? We talk about work-life balance, our very health, end of lockdown, no COVID. We find our securities in these things rather than God and who he is and submitting to who he says he is in his word. It's a reminder to you and I that there is this problem of sin. That sin itself is actually not an external thing, it's an internal thing, it's a heart problem. You and I, myself included, are tempted to run to our various idols and reveal the depths of this ugliness of sin. And you know what? As I read this and I looked at Aaron's response, my first thing that came to mind was, if you call Canterbury home, would you please continue to commit to pray for your leaders? Shepherds who've been called to watch over your soul who will give an account before the Lord one day. That we would grow in a fear and awe of the Lord and his word. That we will not be tempted by the various voices in the world, and maybe even in our own midst that may come up, that ultimately says, let's create a God like this. Would you pray that we will be faithful to what God says in his word. See, God is holy. For us to be in relationship with him, he requires worship alone. What sin reveals, though, is our very heart posture is to continually create a God after our own liking, after our own desires, so we can live as we please. So, from down the mountain, we look up to the mountain. We're given to the very glimpse and glorious and holy place where God is as Moses speaks to God. And it reveals to us the need of atonement. In verses 7 to 14, it's a remarkable account. I mean, down the hill, the people of Israel and Aaron have sinned. They rebelled against God and their sin has so blinded them, they don't actually realize this truth. That God, as he said earlier, is already there. They don't see that they're sinning in the very presence of God. God knows all, sees all. God does not need to go down to the mountain to see what is happening. God says and knows exactly what they're up to. And notice now the language, though, what he says. What does he say to Moses? Go down to who? Your people. Whom who? You brought out of the land of Egypt. He's seen the very people that are rebelling, and then he gives them a name called stiff-necked people. God's wrath and anger is burning. He wants to consume them with this anger. In other words, he says to Moses, Moses, let me destroy them. And you know, let's start again. Let's start again. How will we start again? Let me make a great nation out of you, Moses. Friends, it's a heart-wrenching moment. The very people who are called, God called his own, the very people he said that he led them out of the land of Egypt, has denied him. And so now he dismisses them. I mean, the actual language is, it's much stronger than that. He actually disdains them. He can't actually stand to even be near them. The very language of stiff-necked people Uh, It's actually a visual like of an animal who's wearing a yoke and it's stubborn and will not listen to its master and wants to go its own way. And actually, this language of stiff-necked people will come throughout the story of the Bible as Israel is described often and anyone who's not worshipping God. And it's a warning, friends. It's a very, very dangerous position to be in, not just for them, but for anyone even today. A stiff-necked person refuses to submit to God and his will and his word. And ultimately what it shows is they will not worship God. They will not obey him. 
Dear friends, as we hear this, it should stir something in us. It's to grab our attention of the holiness of who God is, to see his wrath and his grace. It should also make us go, whoa, we've all done this. I mean, in this particular verse here, God is furious. What it shows, it shows the ugliness of sin. What it shows is what sin does. Sin breaks a relationship with God. They're no longer his people, but Moses's. Their rebellion actually demands justice. And in verses 10, you see the statement by God where he says, Let me alone, Moses. Now, I want you to think for a moment. It's not like as a God all of a sudden is like a kid sulking and going off to his room. What's going on here is God knows exactly what's going on down the mountain. God has every right of the creator of the universe, the one who rescued them. He doesn't need Moses' permission. He doesn't even need to consult Moses. Yet he pauses. So what we have in verses 11 to 14 is this moment. God is now showing Moses and showing to all of us the calling that Moses has. He's a mediator. It's as though God is saying to Moses, Moses, you give me the word. You give me the word. I will go down and destroy them. And you know what? Throughout the story of the Bible, you have these images of someone standing between a holy God and a sinful people. It's a powerful picture of grace. God is inviting Moses another way. Another way to look at it is God is leaving the door open for intercession. So Moses steps in. He prays a powerful prayer. Now Moses, you've got to think for a moment. If I was in Moses' shoes, I don't know, I probably wouldn't have done this. But Moses has an opportunity to be spared from the wrath of God. Not just spared, Moses has an opportunity to restart, but Moses becomes the patriarch of a nation. But rather, what does Moses do? He implores God. He begs for mercy. Verses 11 to 13 is a powerful prayer. I would encourage you, if you have time, to go through that prayer word by word. It has been such a good thing for my soul this week. See, what we have in the verses in front of us is actually a short version. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 25, it says he most likely stayed up there and prayed for 40 days and nights. And the fruit of this, God relented. Actually, the better translation is probably God was moved to compassion. We need to remember this. It shows God who he is, that he's relationally invested with his people. Moses changing God's mind does not mean he changed God's sovereign plan. What he's doing is he's actually carrying out God's sovereign plan. God has already said what's going to happen post the fall in Genesis chapter 3. God has already said to Abraham what he has made a commitment to. What the author, that is Moses, is doing in human's terms is showing the very character of who God is. And that very word of relent is connected with the word compassion. God is showing compassion. Firstly, by holding back his wrath to destroy them, and then he invites Moses to intercede on behalf of the people. And Moses makes the case. What Moses appeals to is beautiful. Moses appeals to God's fatherly affection. He says, God, these are your people. Moses appeals to the very faithfulness of who God is. He's saying, God, it's your action. You brought the people out of Egypt. And then Moses appeals to say, God, God, the very nations are watching. Egypt themselves are watching. Your glory is at stake if you destroy them. Moses appeals to God's merciful compassion. He's appealing for God to turn away his wrath. And Moses then appeals finally to his everlasting covenant. God, remember that promise you made to Abraham about Isaac and Israel, your servants. Remember your promise? What's doing, going on here is Moses is playing the role of a mediator. He's not as much focusing on the people, rather he's focusing on who God is and his very character. It is to show who God him, he is, and he is the one who is always faithful. It is us who are faithless. And so God shows mercy He displays his beautiful character and he does not destroy them, but yet there is discipline from God. So Moses turns towards down the hill and heads down the mountain and goes to bring along with him the very commands that the people have broken. 
verses 15 to 29, what you have is this dialogue between Joshua and Moses. Joshua is now an upcoming figure to show who he is. He's not there with the people doing what everyone else is doing. He comes in as a warrior. He hears and goes, wait, is that a battle going on? Is that cry of victory or or, or cry of defeat? And Moses says something interesting. No, it sounds like singing. And these are deliberate words. I don't know if you remember in the story of Exodus, when was the last time that they sang? It was just as they crossed the Red Sea. And why? It was worship to God and what he had done. But this time, it's a different type of singing. I love the way that this commentator put it. It's up here on the screen. This time, the Israelites were singing to an image of a grass-eating, milk-producing, moo-sounding cow. How ridiculous does that sound? This is what sin does, friends. It totally blinds us to the reality and the foolishness of our worship. And I want you to imagine for the scene here. It's such a confronting scene. Moses comes and he sees what's in front of him. And the reason why it's confronting is it's meant to be. As God's prophet, he is stirred up in anger. And it's the same language that's used to describe how angry God is to Israel. This anger moves him to throw the tablets, God's word, broken into pieces. Then he burns the calf and grounds it up into powder. These are visual reactions. This is often what the old prophets would do. I mean, the very breaking of the tablets is to show, Israel, you have broken the very commitment you have to God. You have broken his law. By breaking it, you deserve to, you do not deserve to have his law. That's what Moses is showing as he does these things. Then he grounds and gets them to drink it. It's just showing that taste the bitterness of your sin. It's a reminder how sin goes much deeper. And yes, there is grace, but there is also a requirement for punishment and discipline. And we see this. God does not destroy them. Yet, lovingly, he disciplines them. So Moses questions Aaron in verse 21. Uh, Aaron, like most of us, turns around and goes, he blames everyone else except taking responsibility for himself. But you know what? The, The story of Exodus is very closely related to Genesis in that the reaction is nothing new. It's as old as the garden. Do you remember when God came and confronted Adam and Eve? Oh, it was the woman. Oh, no, no, it was the snake. Oh, no, and ultimately it was you, God. It's your fault. What it does, friends, it reveals when we're confronted with sin, what will be our response? At the heart of sin is always pride. Pride does not want us to confess. Pride often wants us to blame or bring up excuses. Sin feeds off pride. They go hand in hand. I mean, what is our reaction when the Holy Spirit, when the Lord convicts us? What is our reaction when someone who loves us pulls us up on something? Do we bring out excuses or blame others? Friends, what God requires is not excuses. What he requires is confession and turning away from sin. This is how we experience grace. And friends, I want you to know this. I know that we've grown, some of us have grown up in circles who are more than happy to tell you how often you've sinned. That's not what we're talking about. It's talking about a heart posture that says, yes, I have sinned. And when we're caught, what do we say? Do we respond in repentance? The call is to confess and turn to God. But yet, it's a reminder, sin has to be dealt with. Atonement is needed. And so Moses gets to work. He knows exactly who's to blame. The people are running wild. They've given over to their desires. And Aaron should have stopped, but he didn't stop them. So for their sin and rebellion, there's consequences. So Moses steps in and calls out. He asks the question, who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. The question is asked really, who will you serve today? The response is the Levite sons. They come and they gather around Moses. And Moses gives a a, a bunch of instructions, a particular instruction that's actually not from Moses, but from God himself. To kill those to kill particularly those who are most likely the instigators who continue to live in sinful living and worship of this false idol. It's a picture, again, of what God already said. 
worship of any god will mean there will be consequences for that that will lead to death now when you and i read these kind of passages particularly today in kilsyth and uh, in this time and world that we're living in we're caught up with and go whoa that sounds a bit confronting friends god cannot stand sin and the bible doesn't hide that god is god and we are not and in this context Moses is asking the question, whom will you serve? Okay, well then show me how you will serve him. The 3,000 killed are a reminder of God's holiness and character, and the very Levitical priest is to say, this is your role, that you will ensure that the people, there's any sin in the people, that you will get rid of it. But yet, 30, 30 to 35 reminds us, this is not enough. The people have broken the law. They've sinned against God. Sin is led, uh, has been led to them to leading to this consequence of living against God and His will. And yet the language of the Bible reminds us atonement is needed. Their sin has to be covered for. So Moses knows this. And in 32 verses 30 to 34 says this. The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, an angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit I will visit their sin upon them. I mean, I want you to imagine Moses, right? He says, who knows? Who knows? Maybe I can make atonement. There's so much like, he's unsure what's going to happen. I want you to imagine that walk up that mountain. He returns once again, and he intercedes on behalf of his people. And he does something amazing. He says to God, blot me out of your book. When he's talking about this book, and later on in the New Testament, it's described as the book of life. It's a register of all the name of all the saints who are redeemed and will inherit eternal life. It's referring to the names who are living and serving in this life, whose names, it was in a sense imagined at the time, is like a roster in the heavenly courts belonging to the chosen. Moses would rather die than live if these people are not forgiven. It's extraordinary. Moses is willing to have his name struck out for the sake of the people. But yet God gives him an answer. He says, whoever has sinned, I will blot out of my book. And then he instructs Moses to go lead the people. And the very sin has consequences. And that, that, that's shown in the plague that is to come. And the language of plague, we're very familiar with that in the book of Exodus. When did the plague come? Against the Egyptians who are idol worshippers. So the people of Israel experienced this too because they worshipped this idol. God doesn't take up Moses on on his offer this time. Why? Friends, Moses can't atone for the sin of his people when he himself is sinful. Moses has sinned because he's born with sin. See, God is holy Yet God is gracious. And yet in all of this, it is equally and beautifully true. This is why we need someone who is born sinless. The lamb who takes away the sins of the world. This is why the death of Jesus, his atonement for our sin is so significant. We need God's provision for atonement. We need God himself to come down from his mountain to come to a people who have created many idols and worshipping many things and are playing even to this day. Whether it's the idol of religion or the idol of irreligion, our hearts have been led to worship many other gods rather than the God of the Bible. Our hearts have been led to obey everything else but God's word. Jesus is the only one who has truly provide true atonement for our sin against a holy God. You and I deserve to be destroyed. 
You and I need to ha- uh, we deserve to have our names blotted out from the book of life. Yet God offers grace. Not by our means, by his means. Through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who said, not my will, but yours be done. And if you don't know Jesus, I want you to know you're trying to make your own God. You're trying to atone and cover for your own sin in many ways. Whether it's trying to be really good or even socially correct. That will not make you right with a holy and righteous God. You need Jesus. We would invite you to turn to him and follow him. Confess your sin your rebellion, and give your life in worship to Jesus and surrender to him. If you're a follower of Christ, what thing, what thing has grabbed you? What idol is causing you to worship and you're caught in the cycle of sin, whether intentionally or unintentionally? What is your golden calf? Maybe Jesus is simply saying, turn afresh to him again today. Turn to him. See the length that he went to atone for your sin. The reason why at Canary Gardens we talk about being a gospel-centered church, a Christ-centered church, it's the gospel itself that reveals to us how Christ has atoned for our sin and it shows in its full glory who Christ is and what he has done. And it's through that motivation can we only, through the power of the Spirit, grow to hate sin. And there are many of us, even in this season, who are weary followers of Christ. God is holy and he's gracious. And Jesus' atoning work is a reminder, you can't atone for your own sins. Christ has. Rest in the truth, for that is the very engine room through the Spirit to fight sin and idolatry. And you know what? If you are in Christ, if you are in Christ... Your name is written in his book. Sin is still a problem. But because of Christ and his atonement, he gives us, through the power of his spirit, to live a life called in submission to him. And where do we go for that? His word, his commands are there for us, for our good, for his glory, friends. So what is Jesus calling you to surrender to today? So we would invite you to come, surrender. Surrender to our gracious, atoning King. Would you join with me in prayer? Our holy and mighty and righteous God, Lord, we don't deserve any of your grace, but you have been so merciful to us through Jesus as an atoning work. For those of us who know you, we thank you that our name is written in your book. Father, we pray for those who are struggling in various battles of sin. May we look to you. May we submit to your word. And so, Jesus, we surrender in your name. Amen.